in this video i shall be talking about hypokalemia so before proceeding on to the topic i would like to discuss some quick facts about potassium we all know that it is a major intracellular cation the levels being around 150 mq per liter inside the cell it is stored in muscle and hence children with protein energy malnutrition are deficient and they have hypokalemia less than 1% of the total body potassium is in plasma and it moves from intracellular fluid via potassium channels depending on the gradient and is pushed back into the cells via the sodium potassium atps pump the recommend it is responsible for contractility of skeletal smooth and cardiac muscles and the recommended dietary allowance is 1 to 2 mq per kg majority is absorbed in the colon but it is majorly excreted in urine the principal hormone regulating is it is aldosterone which increases its excretion why is it important to all this because many of these questions are asked in the pg entrance exam also and many times in the viva as well and because potassium is a very dangerous kind of electrolyte any level up or down can be nearly fatal also now we know that normal levels in the serum is 3.5 to 5.5 millimole per liter and hypokalemia is when serum potassium is less than 3.5 millimole per liter some people classify its severity as mild being 3 to 3.5 millimole per liter moderate being 2.5 to 3 and severe being less than 2.5 millimole per liter so clinically the patient can either be asymptomatic and it is usually seen in cases with mild hypokalemia only muscle weakness and cramps is one of the common symptoms and this is due to the effect of hypokalemia on skeletal muscles this kind of weakness is usually generalized since it is a systemic cause compared with myositis myopathies etc it can sometimes very severe hypokalemia can lead to paralysis which is ascending in nature and respiratory paralysis is seen in very severe cases and uh, is rare arrhythmias are quite frequent and you should be very cautious with this iron and this is because the cardiac muscles get affected with the levels in blood polyuria and polydipsia are seen due to impaired urinary ability to concentrate and sometimes hypokalemia can worsen hepatic encephalopathy in a setting of acute liver failure due to increased renal ammonia production chronic hypokalemia on the other hand presents as interstitial nephritis and renal cysts now pathophysiology may involve one of the following if there is low level of potassium in the blood then it can either be due to potassium loss or it can be due to transcellular shift that is shift from the extracellular fluid to the intracellular fluid which is usually secondary to drugs and is also seen in a few conditions and sometimes reduced potassium intake which is an extremely rare condition and is seen in patients with anorexia nervosa so if at all it will be seen in adolescent adolescents usually girls spurious hypokalemia is an entity in which is usually in which the body potassium levels are normal but the wbc count in it is seen in conditions like in high wbc counts for example leukemia and sometimes in certain leukemoid reactions also what happens is that when left at room temperature the wbc take up potassium from the plasma so the constant plasma concentration of potassium will decrease but actually the levels in the body are normal that is why it is referred to as spurious now potassium loss can either be through the kidneys which we know is the major organ which is responsible for excretion of potassium now this is seen in conditions with the use of diuretics if excess mineralocorticoids are there renal tubular acidosis diabetic ketoacidosis and certain syndromes like barter's and gittleman syndrome it can also be extra renal for example the most common is git and it is very common cause in children usually with vomiting so it is seen in diarrhea vomiting and even laxative abuse usually in older children and skin which is again very rare transcellular shift transcellular means from the extracellular to the intracellular fluid is usually secondary to certain drugs like insulin sodium bicarbonate salbutamol and other beta agonists we know this very well and granulocyte colony stimulating factor actually what happens is that this drug causes rapid cell proliferation and uptake of potassium as we saw in the cases with spurious hypokalemia 
and this is in contrast to the rapid cell destruction which is seen in tumor lysis syndrome and tumor lysis syndrome is characterized by hyperkalemia hypokalemia due to transcellular potassium shift is also seen in patients with alkalosis and it is more common in metabolic than in respiratory alkalosis then in patients with hypokalemic periodic paralysis and refeeding syndrome seen in patients with protein energy malnutrition now the diagnosis involves a very good history taking most of the time a diagnosis of the etiology of hypokalemia actually hypokalemia you can diagnose based on the lab values of plasma potassium but the thing is that uh, sorry serum potassium the thing is you want to know the etiology so etiology is most of the time clear with a good history taking itself and you should also do a good clinical examination especially ruling out hypertension for mineralocorticoid excess electrocardiogram is very important especially in grading in uh, assessing the how impact the physiological impact on the heart muscles the cardiac muscles and it is characterized by depressed st segment flattened or biphasic t waves a prominent u wave and sometimes ventricular fibrillation and torsade st points might also occur in severe cases you should be very cautious so in patients with potassium abnormalities you should put these patients ideally on ecg monitoring i guess you understand the meaning of torsade st points torsade st points this is not the classical photograph of torsade st points it is of ventricular fibrillation torsade st points means twisting of points and it is like twisting of the ecg graph around a rope if you remember the photograph then you would understand what i am trying to say, tell you people now further diagnosis of the etiology if you are still not clear can be the following investigations can be helpful ph metabolic acidosis with hypokalemia is seen in conditions like severe dehydration usually accompanied with severe diarrhea and renal tubular acidosis whereas metabolic alkalosis with hypokalemia is seen in conditions like vomiting diuretics and certain renal syndromes like barters and gittelmans serum magnesium levels are also important because hypomagnesemia can be a cause of refractory hypokalemia trying to correct still it is not getting corrected then you must look for serum magnesium levels and also serum calcium for barter syndrome plasma aldosterone from cushing syndrome and other relevant investigations depending on the underlying etiology you are suspecting now urinary potassium excretion can also be estimated by 24 hour urinary collection in level in which levels less than 20 mmol per liter are suggestive of extra renal cause of urinary excretion sorry of uh, potassium excretion and more than 20 mmol per liter will suggest a urine a renal cause of potassium excretion then spot potassium creatinine ratio fractional excretion of potassium ion and ttkg calculation ttkg is trans tubular potassium gradient and this is the formula sometimes the examiners are very fascinated in asking questions as these so you must know what it is it is basically the gradient between potassium which is present in the lumen of cortical collecting duct to that in the peritubular capillaries so if ttkg is more than 4 along with hypokalemia then it suggests an excess urinary loss of potassium whereas if ttkg is less than 3 with hypokalemia then it would suggest an extra renal loss of potassium TTKG is normally around 8 and if levels are more than 10 it will suggest hyperkalemia which i'll discuss in the next video now the management will depend on certain conditions management of hypokalemia depends primarily on a few factors first is the potassium levels which we have seen second is the clinical symptomatology whether or not the patient is symptomatic or asymptomatic next is renal function potassium should ideally not be supplemented if renal functions are compromised because kidneys are the main organ for potassium excretion as we have already seen in the first scene then presence of any factor causing transcellular shift because in that case just the treatment of the underlying cause can relieve hypokalemia the classical example is insulin deficiency seen in children with diabetic ketoacidosis and then ongoing losses because replacement in these conditions should be millimole for millimole and then patient's ability to tolerate oral potassium also because it is a gastric irritant and one should be very cautious in using iv potassium 
The starting oral dose is 1 to 2 MEQ per kg per day and maximum which can be given is 60 MEQ in divided doses and the IV dose is 0.5 to 1 MEQ per kg over 1 hour. The adult maximum is 40 MEQ. Now coming on to the management of mild hypokalemia which we normally do. In a stable asymptomatic child you can just suggest having increased potassium rich diet which includes bananas, oranges and other citrus fruits, raisins, cherries, tomatoes, fruit juices, especially coconut water and also nuts. In a sick child you can add 0.5 ml injection pot flow that is around 1 MEQ per 100 ml of IV fluid in addition to the maintenance value. You should be very cautious while adding potassium chloride IV because ideally these patients should be kept under cardiac monitoring because of the risk of hyperkalemia and we already know that oral, oral potassium has very poor palatability and tolerance since it is irritant to the gastric mucosa. So you must also know the composition. 1 ml of injection pot chlor has 2 MEQ of potassium ion and 15 ml of syrup pot chlor has 20 MEQ of potassium ion. In moderate cases if the child is accepting orally you can manage with syrup pot chlor whereas in a sick child you can increase the dose and add up to 1 ml potassium injection pot chlor to 100 ml of IV fluid in addition to the maintenance value. Under strict cardiac monitoring I am repeating it again and again and should preferably avoid the IV route. One can use potassium acetate or citrate in patients with acidosis with hypokalemia which is actually very rare since acidosis is usually accompanied with hyperkalemia but can be seen in conditions like DK and RTA. Also potassium phosphate can be used if along with hypokalemia there is hyperphosphatemia also that is phosphate deficiency is also there. So you can use other preparations instead of potassium chloride per se. For severe hypokalemia if serum potassium levels are between 2 to 2.5 millimole per liter add injection pot flow 1.5 ml per 100 ml IV fluid and for less than 2 millimole per liter add injection pot flow 2 ml per 100 ml of IV fluid. Also neat potassium chloride infusion can be given via the central line because uh, I have usually seen this in adults and uh, not in children. You should preferably avoid giving IV potassium chloride and if at all you should be very very cautious. This is uh, the third or fourth time I am repeating and central line is required to prevent peripheral necrosis and uh, maximum you can give via the central line is 150 to 200 MEQ. But along with this you know that if you don't treat hypomagnesemia, correction of hypokalemia can be refractory and treatment of the underlying cause is also quintessentially important if you want to treat hypokalemia in the patient. Thank you so much for your patient watching and please do share the knowledge. Thank you.